So I'm Charles Weir. I'm a lecturer at Lancaster University, and this work is partly funded by a lovely organization called Petras, who are, and we're looking into health devices, health-related devices, and how you make them more secure. But what I'm interested in is the fun bit of safeguarding. How do you actually figure out what is the security you should be doing and why? And this was based on an observation. I did some work with over a dozen companies, big, small, government, non-government, all sorts of people. Um, and in every single case, I found that the team involved had no very clear or the wrong idea of what it was that they were doing security and privacy about. So in this talk, I'm going to look at all these aspects of safeguarding. What is it? How do we think up what could go wrong? Where should we start? How do we go about fixing it? And then a key one, which is often neglected, which is how do you actually get to do all this stuff having identified it? So let's take a couple of stories to start with. Familiar? Cambridge Analytical scandal was where Facebook was found to be unwittingly aiding and abetting a rather nasty company whose job was to um, influence elections. And the problem when you look into it was that actually Facebook's security was really, really good. They were, it was very difficult to hack their APIs, et cetera. But somebody, this company, Cambridge Analytica, thought, hmm, if we can con people into giving them, giving them what they know, if we can con half a million people into sort of telling us all about their friends, then by golly, we'll know about everybody in the country. And that's precisely what they did. They were breaking all sorts of terms and conditions with Cambridge Analytica, with Facebook, but there was nothing to stop them doing it. Well, here's another one. Phoenix Project. Lovely book. I, if you haven't read it, I recommend take a, take a um, deco at it. It's, it's really rather good. Um, and it's a book about DevOps and Agile, really, and introducing it. And in it, there's a security expert character who turns up about sort of once every 30 pages and says, oh, you should be doing more. And everybody says, yes, we probably should be, but we haven't got time because the house is burning. And, you know, we need to finish this by next Thursday. And eventually disaster strikes and the auditors turn up and all these security things haven't been put in. And it turns out that none of the security things were needed. It turns out that actually the normal manual checks handled everything fine and the security and the auditors went away quite happy. Or a much more scary one here was the WhatsApp thing. WhatsApp's used a lot by people like um, journalists in, shall we say, hostile environments. And it turns out that WhatsApp, who were defended wonderfully against people hacking their um, security, you know, their protocols for messaging, actually had left a small bug in the application, which allowed somebody to take over a phone. Now, if that had been a little known app, it wouldn't have mattered. But WhatsApp is absolutely guaranteed to be used by people who can ill afford that. And so what could have been a rather, you know, minimal problem was actually a really very, very serious and damaging, um, you know, security problem. So what you might think is a security problem or a privacy problem is sometimes not. And what you might think is not, or at least not a big one, sometimes is. And that's where 
we move on to what do we do about it? And the first thing we want to do about it is to figure out as a team, and this has to be done traditionally by the developers. This is your job. This is my job. Um, by the developers working with the architects and, if possible, with the customers or the um, product managers. And we need to work out all these things in advance, what could possibly go wrong. That's not easy. The solution I recommend, and I will give you the tools to do this at the end of this talk, is some kind of workshop. You need several people to get together and certainly some sort of um, brainstorming session is really important. And that's exactly what I tend to do. I, we use, um, we have people brainstorm onto post-it notes all the things that might go wrong. Um, now, you might think this is difficult, but yesterday we had a group of people online <clears throat> at ACCU doing just this kind of threat assessment. We were actually using cards as prompts and we got a lot more threats out for, a, for an application even than that. And some of them were really quite, um, what do you call it? Erudite, surprising. And we got all of the standard ones and all of the problems. It's surprisingly easy to do. There are card games, you know, cards against developers kind of games that help you with it. Um, elevation of privilege. We looked at two others yesterday. But actually, it turns out if you just ask the question, what could possibly go wrong? Who might do what bad thing to whom using my app? Turns out you'll get some good answers. So, having got those good answers, that's all very well, but what are we going to do with them? That was an awful lot of, of um, you know, this could go wrong, that could go wrong. And indeed, that's why a lot of developers hate security, because it's all about just things that could go wrong. So we need focus. And the way we start getting focus is by some sort of risk assessment. Here's what we really want. We want... Is it likely? Is it unlikely? How big an impact is it going to have if it happens? Now, most teams can work out the impact. You know, you can probably figure out how bad something would be. And if, if not, your customers will certainly know. But the likelihood is something that is a lot underestimated. I'm, I'm doing a lot of work on this at the moment. So, for example, Let's suppose we are dealing in devices to go in people's bodies. You might think that the most unlikely, the most likely is the sort of thing you get in thrillers. Just saw it on, what's that Sherlock Holmes one? Um, <clears throat> you know, somebody trying to kill somebody with it. Actually, never happened. Doesn't worry people in the trade at all. What they're worried about is professionals taking shortcuts like sharing um, uh, sharing logins or emailing details that are really rather sensitive to each other on the open, or no, using open email accounts, things like that. They are likely, they are incredibly embarrassing if they if they get found out. And they are um, and you know, and it's not a this is this is a security and privacy problem, yes. But the people doing it, they're not hackers. They are actually the goodies. They're the heroes of the story. And yet they are still the problem. So we can get our risk, our impact. And we have here then a whole set of requirements, but really, we only have one lot, and typically you do get about four in that high impact likely set. Um, you, we only have one lot that really matter. And fixing those will pretty much solve most of our security problems. So 
How could we fix them? What sorts of things are good for fixing security problems? I'm going to go through a few standard ones now. The first one is quite common, functionality changes. So things like, oh no, it turns out that uh, you know, people can see odd little bits of metadata about their friends that they weren't supposed to see or about the project or about the company that they really weren't supposed to see. Well, we better just fix it so that they can't. There's some problem that allows a hacker to, to um, you know, put in dodgy SQL statements. Okay, we'll do the standard fix and make it so that they can't do that. Functionality changes, that's a common outcome. Another one, which is more general purpose, is your components. Often the problems you have in a piece of software are nothing to do with the code you've written. It's just that the components have got security bugs in them. Now, the lovely thing about this is also the thing that makes it most dangerous. It's that other people will find those bugs for you. It's lovely because it means you don't have to do anything. They'll find them, they'll fix them. The thing that also makes it dangerous is that the um, is that hackers will also find them. And therefore, that's a really, really easy way for them to, to do their bad things. I remember talking to a pen tester who told me he doesn't bother with um, the, you know, doesn't bother just trying standard things. He figures out for each piece of software what components they're likely to be used using, looks up the standard, um, uh, you know, the standard attacks on each one, and he usually gets one or two. So that's a powerful way of making sure you're, you're software is pretty good. Um, you can get tools that will tell you whether um, there needs to be a particular, you know, whether, whether your components are okay or not. White Source does it, and there is a whole list that you can find. Um, and for relatively little effort, that's probably your best low-hanging fruit for security. You can also get tools like Checkmarks, Veracode, SNCC, that will do static analysis and see if your own code, they often incorporate the component checking that I mentioned before, and they will, um, and good ones tend to be integrated with your, you know, your, your um, version control and your, um, uh, your defect tracking. And the last, is harder work. Code review used to mean to me that team of people sat down, looked at a function or something and came up with various things that might be wrong. But these days, actually, it's much more common for code review to be simply somebody checking over the changes that one wants to check into the code repository and double checking them for things that might be wrong. And if you add security things that might be wrong, that's a nice lightweight way of making sure that, that you know, you minimize the number of security problems you've got. So with all that, we've now got a list of four, a few things that, that we might really want to fix right now. And we've also got a list of um, possible ways that we might address them. The next problem is that we're only the developers. We don't have the money. How do you get that effort and that money? How do you get our own effort and money allocated? Here's our Kanban board. Security things, in my experience, tend to end up in the icebox unless you have a real strong security culture. They just end up 
unused. So what can you do about that? Well, the way we approach it is to think about product owners, product managers, how do they think? And I, I love this, I found it. It's what we're generally talking about in terms of product owners, whether it's senior management or the customer or whoever, they're thinking about what of our of the stuff that I might do is desirable, is feasible, and is profitable. So let's look at, for example, that, that upgrading and think about how a product owner might think about them. Right, need to do the upgrade. Is it desirable? No. Customers won't care. Is it feasible? Yes. Is it profitable? No. So why don't we turn it round and say, we're offering up-to-date industry standard security. Now we can say on all of those, it's desirable, it's feasible, but it's also profitable because it becomes a selling point. So we've got another one. This was one of my favorites where we had customers needing more effort for particular projects than other ones, and the people for whom it's more effort, they tend to jib at it and say, no, 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 we don't want to pay for this. Security is your problem. It's just technical. And they said, why don't we just offer different levels of security? Because then you can say, well, you're, you're applications really quite sensitive you know you're gathering sensitive data you're doing you know you've got you've got you'll be terribly embarrassed if anything went wrong i think you're going to need gold security and that costs a bit more but it's well worth paying for and all of a sudden you've got something that is both desirable and feasible and in the case of that company it's proved very profitable and so what we tend to do nowadays is you take that list of improvements, remember the five, and the developer, the same development team sits down and thinks of ways of turning the question round from let's fix a security bug to what does this, what benefits do we get by fixing it? And that gives the product owners something to reason about and get it right. Not, of course, that the that means that they'll necessarily do the right thing. Certainly, they might put the security thing into, you know, into the sprint. Yeah, they may, they may say, yes, we'll pay for this, or yes, we'll do this. But they may also quite rightly say, Nah, don't care. We never want to do that. It's a perfectly good outcome for a security improvement to say, no, it's not worth the effort. But that must be a business decision. It's not a developer's decision. So, in summary, we've talked about Safeguarding, keeping people safe, keeping their security and their privacy safe. We've talked about how we think up what could go wrong. We talked about where we start. So prioritizing what could possibly go wrong. We've talked about where four standard ways of fixing these things that can go wrong. And We've talked about something really important, which is helping product owners, product management, whoever it is that decides what our product is going to have in it and where our effort is spent, helping them to balance those security decisions 
against all the other functionality and, and bug fixes that are required. And I promised to um, that there would be practical stuff at the end of this talk. So I can offer you three things. First of all, in opposite order, we have workshop materials. You can run your own workshops to find these answers for your own projects. So we've got full instructions how to do those workshops. And there's also a kind of game that people seem to enjoy playing that ex that, that helps people understand this, um, this idea that, that security is just not something you have to do. It's, it's a product decision. We've also, if it would help, got a security survey that people can do online. And we can summarize where your team is and what it might have to do next or want to do next in order to, to improve. And if you want to get involved more and you're anything to do with health software, get in touch with us at the Hipster Project. That's langsterac.uk slash hipster. And we can um, support you in doing these things yourself. 